Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we're going to be reviewing a telescopic controller. This is called the G8 Galileo from a company called GameSir. Now, I have no idea why they decided to name this after an Italian astronomer. Maybe we'll find out by the end of the video. Now, you probably know the deal with these types of controllers. Essentially, you put a phone inside and then you can play your games on it and it's supposed to be a quote unquote handheld experience. Now, I've never been a huge fan of this experience just because it's always felt like a compromise in one way or another, either the controls, the ergonomics, or maybe the software. And so it's never really hit home for me and that's why I prefer to use dedicated handhelds and that's kind of one of the reasons why I have this channel in the first place. Now, Gamester reached out to me a couple months ago and said, hey, we've got this new one coming out. We want you to review it. and I slow down in these types of reviews. They're just not much of interest to me. If you review one, you've reviewed them all. And so I said, you can send it out to me and I'll try it out, but I don't plan on doing a dedicated review. Instead, I'll just maybe embed it into another video that I make, something that might be of more value to my audience. And they agreed to that. Now, once I finally got it in hands and started testing it, I was actually really impressed to the point where I changed my mind. I decided to make a dedicated review. And given the fact that I have such a huge list of things I need to review, that kind of means a lot for me. That means that I was pushing down other things so that I could put this one higher priority. That means the controller's gotta be pretty darn Darn good for me to do that. And yes, I have to say that this thing is pretty great. It doesn't feel like a compromise. It's the first controller that I've had that actually feels like something that came from a console. And so I did want to kind of take some time and do a deep dive dedicated review to that concept. Now it's not going to be the same as using a dedicated handheld. As you can imagine, you know, the wider phones that we have today just make it a really kind of weird experience. And so that's still here. But in all of the respects, it's really impressive. And the coolest thing about it is the price. It's $80 retail and that's a lot cheaper than a lot of other ones on the market like the Backbone or the Razer Kishi which all cost more but are also a lot worse and so that's why I wanted to make a video here today is because this thing is actually really incredible in terms of the value that you get for it for the price if you're okay with this kind of setup and so we're going to talk about that here in this video in fact we're actually going to do a whole history lesson and talk about all the different controllers I've used before and what I like and what I don't like about them and what makes this one so special and so without any further delay Hey, let's just go ahead and jump in. Okay, let's start by talking about where you can buy it and what the price is going to be. Like I mentioned before, it's about $80 and it's actually already up on Amazon. However, GameSir also gave me some coupon codes and I'll have them down in the video description below and they work for both Amazon and their own website. And it's 15% off on Amazon, which is going to bring the price down to I think something like $68, which is really reasonable. And then I've got a 10% coupon for their website, which will make it like $72. And according to their website, they'll ship for free wherever they ship to. And so if you don't have access to Amazon, this might be a better alternative. Either way, all the links will be down below in case you are interested. Next, let's move over and start talking about some of the features and specs of the controller. There's not a lot here, but I do want to go over them real quick. Number one, this uses a USB-C connection port. It actually will move up and down, which makes it easy to slot in. But bear in mind, if you don't have an iPhone 15, then it doesn't have a lightning port adapter. However, it will work with all USB-C phones as well as the iPhone 15. But also bear in mind, like with many of these other controllers, this one is meant to be used without a case on your phone. Now, in terms of compatibility, they have a pretty big range right here. It's about four to seven inches or 115 to 185 millimeters. On their Amazon sales page, they do have a few listed that don't fit. But one thing to keep in mind is that it's actually moddable and you can stretch it even further. One of my friends, Retro Breeze, actually got a review unit as well, and he took this apart and actually modded it so that he can use it with much larger devices. And so I'll leave a link to his video down below if you do want to try this out, but it looks pretty darn easy. And so if you are looking to play this with something larger, even a tablet, I think he got all the way up to 12 inch tablets working, then this is definitely going to be an option for you. For this video here, we're just going to use it vanilla with regular phones. And one last note about the size of the phone, if you have one of those with a big camera bump, then it still is going to work fine. They've already designed that in there, and so there's five millimeters of space there for your camera. Of note, on the bottom, it does have pass-through charging. Not every single phone is going to work. Again, they have that listed on their Amazon page. And it's also got a dedicated 3.5 millimeter headphone jack if you want to listen while playing as well. I did try out pass-through charging on all the phones that I tested it with, and every single one of them worked fine. But bear in mind, it's very likely it won't do fast charging, it's just going to be a regular charge. Now when it comes to controls, we've got some premium features. We have Hall Effect sensors for both our joysticks as well as the triggers, and they've got some neat features baked in, including detachable face plates. Now they don't have any extra designs available just yet, but I hope they offer them in the future. In addition, we've got a couple different joystick caps to work with, we'll test that out later as well. 
And a couple of other things worth noting, we have two buttons on the back which are programmable, and this controller actually supports three different control modes. We have what they call PS mode, which is supposed to mimic a PlayStation controller, and then we have our standard Android mode, and this is probably what you're going to be using most of the time. And then also they've got key mapping software available for this controller, and so you can actually use touchscreen games as well. And of course we'll test all these here in a moment. But before we get to that, let's go ahead and do the unboxing. As I mentioned before, this is a review unit sent over to me from GameSir. But as always, I'm not being paid in any way for this review, and they're not seeing it ahead of time, and all opinions are my own. Now, on the box itself, we just got a listing of features, so let's go ahead and dive right in. First thing to note, we have three different analog stick caps, like I mentioned before, and we will test these out. There's also a little box with a bunch of paperwork inside, and not a lot going on here. We've got a sticker, and then a warranty card, and then also an instruction manual. And this manual is pretty handy, it's in a bunch of different languages as well, but if you want to know how to use hotkeys, things like that, it's all spelled out here. Next up, let's take a look at the controls, and first impressions here, this feels very sturdy and also is very ergonomically balanced. And honestly, the design is not unlike some of their other controllers, which we'll talk about in a moment. But yeah, I'm really impressed by the sturdiness of this controller overall. Let's go ahead and check out the controls before we move on. We'll start with the analog sticks. Like I mentioned, these are Hall Effect sensors, and they are quite big. In fact, they are console size, if you ask me. I would say they're about the size of a typical Xbox controller sticks, and they do have a grippy kind of texture around the cap as well, so these feel really great. They're also nice and smooth to the touch with a wide range of motion. Next we'll take a look at the D-pad. Now this is clicky, but does have a softish kind of click to it. So definitely not soft and mushy like a retro D-pad, more along the lines of something like an Xbox One or an Xbox Series D-pad instead. And I think it feels okay, it does feel very precise as you're clicking it around, but of course the best way to test this is to try it with a couple specific games. We'll start with the Contra test first, so in this one I'm going to push down on the d-pad and then rock it left and right. And the goal here is to make sure that my character doesn't move too much. It's okay if it moves a little bit, and I think in this regard it works very well. There's never been a moment when I'm playing a game like Contra where I hit a diagonal on accident. If anything, I would say it's skewed a little bit more to the other side, where hitting a diagonal does require some deliberate movement. And of course, when I'm deliberately trying to hit a diagonal, then I try a different game, and that's going to be a Street Fighter one. We're going to do Street Fighter 3 Third Strike. Now here I'm trying to test whether or not it's Hadoukenable or Shuyukenable, whether or not I can do a fireball or a dragon punch. And I gotta say here it's not great. I am hitting them every once in a while, but the dragon punches are a lot harder than the fireballs. And right off the bat I do have to say I'm not super acclimated to playing fighting games with a clicky d-pad, and so I'm kind of out of my element, but all the same I'm hitting maybe a 50 or 60% success rate. So I guess the way I would see it, if you are good with this type of d-pad then you should probably be fine, but in general I wouldn't recommend using this controller specifically only for fighting games games. And I think that's okay when it comes to a modern style controller like this, you're mostly going to be doing things like game streaming and maybe high-end emulation. And in most of those cases, you're probably not going to use the diagonals as much as you would if you were playing retro games. Either way, I would say it's not really passing that test according to my standards, but all the same, I don't think it's going to matter that much anyway. Now also on the left side, we have two different function buttons. We have a screenshot button and then what they call the M button. We'll go into this here later. But let's move over to the right side and talk about the face buttons. These do have a rubber membrane connection, so they are a lot like an Xbox or PlayStation or even a retro controller. And these feel great to me. They have a nice glossy texture to them, a good amount of travel, and they're very responsive. And so I think these are really good. And they do remind me the most of an Xbox controller's buttons, but a little bit smaller. Now up top we have our select and start buttons. These have a dome switch connection, and they feel a little bit clicky, but still really good. And like with all the other buttons, they're nice and quiet as well. And finally on the bottom right, we have a multi-function game sir button. This one does a few different things. I think they call it the menu button, but I personally call it the chicken button. Okay, next I want to take a look at the shoulders and triggers. We'll start with the triggers first. And to me, these are almost a dead ringer to an Xbox series triggers, which are some of my favorite in the world, so I'm really happy with this. And same thing with the shoulder buttons. They're very similar to what you find on an Xbox. In fact, they make like full-on Xbox controllers, and so it's very similar to those. And I've got no complaints here. I'm a huge fan of this type of controller, and I love the fact that these controls are really console-like. Next we'll talk about ergonomics. Now this has some really big grips to it compared to other controllers. And as you pick it up, it's going to be immediately apparent that they are taking a design cue from something like an Xbox controller. It has the same kind of angle to it and the same size grip, and again, I don't think that's a bad thing at all. Like I mentioned, it doesn't feel like it's a compromise in any sort of way. In fact, when doing a side-by-side -side comparison with something like an Xbox Series controller, they are so similar. It's really just about the fact that this one is wider than the other. So in general, if you prefer to use an Xbox-style controller, or maybe you just don't mind one at all, this is going to be a very seamless experience between 
between the two. So in general, when it comes to just the ergonomics and feel of this device, yeah, it's super sturdy, but then also very ergonomic. It's obviously modeled after other controllers, and I don't think that's a bad thing at all. Next, we'll take a look at the bottom. So we have our USB-C pass-through charging, as well as our 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. And that's really about it. It's a very simple design. Of note, on the back, we have a textured plastic, very similar again to an Xbox Series controller. And I think it feels really good and it's not rubberized or anything. It's a hard plastic. It does feel very solid. And then finally, on the back, we have our two programmable back buttons. Now these can actually be mapped on the fly by pressing the M button and one of these back buttons and then picking whatever button you want it to mimic. But it can also be done in software, which we'll test later as well. So I think it's time to put a phone in it and actually start testing it out. Here's a look at my phone. This is an LG V6. And I've had this one for about a year or two now at this point, and I generally use this when I'm doing emulation testing for controllers like this. It's got a Snapdragon 865, which means it can play up to like PS2 and GameCube, no problem. Anyway, setting this up is pretty easy. You just connect it to the USB-C connector and then open up the controller to be able to accommodate the size of your phone. And yeah, it's a perfect fit. This is obviously a standard phone size, and so as a result, this is probably what most phones are gonna look like anyway. And the slider here is spring-loaded and has a lot of tension, so I don't think you're ever gonna have a moment where this is gonna actually fall out of the case at all. So yeah, in a nutshell, it feels very sturdy, but it is a rather big controller experience as well. To give you an idea of the size of it, let's do a quick comparison. We'll start with a dedicated handheld like the Nintendo Switch Lite. Now this one obviously has a smaller screen by virtue of it not being so wide. It's only 16 by nine on the Switch Lite. But you can see that the Nintendo Switch Lite is quite a bit smaller when you have the Game Sir and phone connected together. I think in terms of general size, it's about neck and neck with the ROG Ally. Now I don't consider the Ally to be a huge handheld, but I know some people do. And so this might kind of turn you off just right here. But for me, I think it's okay. And it's still a little bit smaller than a Steam Deck, as you can see. Now in comparison to other phone style setups, we'll start with the Razer Edge. This is is essentially a phone tablet that's attached to a Razer Kichi controller. And you can see that this one's pretty compact. It's actually smaller than the GameSir G8. And same thing with the Backbone controller when connected to a similarly sized phone. This one's a little bit smaller, but honestly not by much. The biggest thing taking up all the screen real estate in either of these setups is going to be the phone itself, and you can't really get around that. So in my opinion, I don't mind the fact that the GameSir one is bigger than the Backbone one because it's a lot more comfortable to use. And I'd rather have a little bit of a larger size if that means I'm going to have better controls overall. And it's actually smaller than some other telescopic controller setups like this one from Nacon. And so let's go over and start talking about our other telescopic controller options. We're going to start with the Backbone controllers because these are the ones that I will generally recommend to people if they are in the market for a new controller for their phone. And I've showed off these controllers a lot in other videos, and so I don't want to retread too much of that information, but I do want to mention there are two different models. One is just a standard black one, and then they have a white PlayStation model one as well. And these are definitely on the smaller side. They have very clicky D-pad and face buttons, and the analog sticks too are also very small. Anyway, hooking this up is almost exactly like how we were just showing with the game, sir. And honestly, they get the job done, but they are very clicky and also feel a little bit fragile or flimsy. Either way, for the longest time, these were kind of the best out there, and so I definitely have made recommendations for these before. Now let's take a look at another one. This is the Razer Kishi version 2. And this is actually the one that I pulled off my Razer Edge, which is the tablet I was showing earlier. Now, I don't think Razer would ever admit it, but I think this one definitely took some design cues from the backbone because these two were designed very similarly. They have very clicky buttons, small analog sticks, all the works. And like I mentioned, if you buy a Razer Edge, it'll actually come with this already. And you can also buy it separately. I think it's around $100 like the Backbone. And I think for what it does, it's not a bad controller, but the GameSir has really kind of pushed this one out of the competition space. Now, speaking of which, let's talk about another GameSir controller. This one is called the X2. And this one's been out for years and there've been different models, an X3, an X2 Pro, and all of those I haven't liked as much as the original X2 right here. This one has some very clicky buttons as well, including triggers that are not analog input. And it's also a little Little bit weird that the USB connection is on the left side instead of the right, and it can present an issue with certain games and you'll have to use a specific rotation app to fix it. Either way, when you actually have the phone inside, one of my favorite things about it is the blockier design. It starts to feel more like a cohesive package than actually just slapping a controller onto a phone. And so this is one I've kept around for years, but I don't use it that often, mostly because it does have kind of a dated design at this point. Okay, let's talk about a few others. This one here is called the Game Vice Flex. And this one is also about $100, and it's very similar to the original Razer Kishi. It's cool that you can cram it together to make it smaller, and then you can unlatch it on the back and it'll make it wider to accommodate a phone. Now the thing that separates this one from the others is that you can't just slide it into the controller. It's not going to work that way. Instead, you've got a bunch of different inserts that you can choose from. 
And the unique thing here is that they have some that they call case inserts. So if you want to use one specifically that will fit your case, they've got a selection of different options here. And so chances are you'll be able to use it just fine. But for this video here, I'm just going to use the standard phone one. So I'm not going to use it with a case. And all you have to do is just push in these rubber inserts. And then when you put the phone in, yeah, it'll fit right there. And I think it works pretty good. It's actually a fairly comfortable design, but it does look a little bit chunky. And I would say in terms of sticks and D-pad and buttons, these are actually better than all the other ones we were just looking at, other than, of course, the Gamesur G8. And I do like the chunkiness here because it does feel pretty big. But the thing that bothers me about this one is the same thing I didn't like about the original Razer Kishi. And that is the little latch slots on the back are right where your fingers are going to be. And it doesn't feel comfortable to me at all. It feels like I'm pushing on the back of some sort of contraption. And so when I try to play games with this thing, I am just constantly reminded of the fact that this is not an actual controller, but something that's slapped onto a phone. And so I really don't like the feel on the back here to the point where it prevents me from using it at all. Another thing worth noting, Putting it back together in that smaller form factor is a pain in the butt when you have those rubber inserts. So if you do pick one of these up, just be prepared to have a little bit of patience when you do this part. Okay, and finally, the other two I wanted to show off here just as a quick demonstration are both from Nacon. And bear in mind, these are both Bluetooth controllers, so they are not hooked up directly, which means you may have some input lag. Now this first one they call the MGX. It's a little bit taller of a controller, and this one retails for about $80 as well. And this one's very sturdy and comes with a nice D-pad, analog sticks, and face buttons. But the thing that really takes away from this one are the trigger buttons. They are some of the hardest trigger buttons I've ever used at all. In fact, it's very frustrating to try to use these triggers in any sort of way. And so unfortunately, if you're going to be playing any game that requires triggers, I would say it's not going to be really worth it. It's almost comical how hard you have to press down on these triggers. I've never seen a controller like that. Now, the other one is their upgraded one. It's called the MGX Pro. And to be honest, yeah, the controls are good. I think these sticks are better. The D-pad's good. It has some really big, chunky face buttons. It reminds me of like a Neo Geo controller. And thankfully, also, the triggers are not half bad either. But the thing that really takes away from this one is just how darn wide it is. I don't understand why they made a controller that's just so big. When you put a phone inside, it is just ridiculous. It feels like playing a platter instead of an actual controller. To give you an idea, this thing is wider than the Steam Deck, and it's just really insane to do that, considering the fact that phones themselves are already wide enough. And so between these two, I don't really recommend these ones at all. In fact, I think they have some pretty fatal flaws. The Pro version is just obviously way too wide, but then also on the non-Pro one, those triggers are just terrible. And also, like I mentioned, these are Bluetooth, which means you'll have to charge them individually, and then also it may have some input delay as well. Anyway, that's a brief look at all these different controllers and their flaws, which I think helps to illustrate why I'm so excited about the game Sir G8. So let's get back to that controller and start talking about some of its additional features. To start, like I mentioned, the face plates on the front are fully detachable. They're magnetic, so very easy to take off. And I do hope that they offer additional faceplate designs in the future. And when you have the face plates off, this is where you're going to pull off the joystick caps and add other ones. So let's test those out, starting with the first one, which is called the dome cap. This one's actually kind of similar in size to the other one, but it has a more rounded top to it with a circular kind of pattern. And for me personally, I'm not really drawn to this kind of design. I prefer the original one over this. So yeah, I don't really see myself using this one in the future. Next up, we have a high profile joystick cap. Now this one's pretty tall and I actually really like that. And I do like the fact that it gives you a little bit more precise controls compared to the original ones. It's not that much higher, but all the same, I can definitely tell a difference. Now, unfortunately, only one each of these caps actually comes with a controller. So you're going to be a little bit offset. And so I'm not really sure if you'd rather have this on the left analog stick or the right one, but I do appreciate that we have the option. And finally, on the right, we have a smaller one. This is similar in size to the original X2. And I'm not really sure why someone would want a smaller cap, but all the same, if you do prefer this, then you've got one option here. In the end, I'm pretty happy with just the standard caps that we have here. I've got no complaints about it. If anything, I would take one of these taller controls and maybe put it on the right analog stick for more precise movement, but that's about it. Okay, next we'll talk about some of the hotkeys you can do on the controller when you're using it with a phone. To start, my favorite one is if you press the chicken button and then up and down on the D-pad, it'll actually adjust the volume. And that really comes in clutch instead of having to reach down and find it on your phone. This makes it for a very seamless user experience. Another thing you can set up are hair triggers. So you hold on to the M button and then press either the left or right trigger. And after that, it'll give a 100% signal anytime you press on these triggers. So that'll be great if you're playing a game that doesn't really require analog inputs at all. And you can tell it's working when the M button flashes red. Now to turn it off, you just do the same thing. Hold on to the M button and then press whatever trigger. And then it'll go back to a full analog input. 
Now it also has built-in turbo, so if you press the M button and then any other button, it'll basically turn into turbo mode. And you'll know it's working because the chicken will flash red when you're pressing down. In fact, you can just hold the button down for turbo if you'd like as well. Another neat function is that you can swap out the A, B, and X, Y pattern. To do that, you hold on to the M button, then the A button for a few seconds. And so with this hotkey, you can swap between a Nintendo or Xbox style layout. So for example, here when I'm playing OutRun 2006, now the A button is the B button. And of course, if I want to change it back, I just hold on to the M button and the A button again, and it'll swap it back to Xbox mode. So this will be great depending on the emulator or the game that you're playing. So next let's talk about a couple use cases and why you might want to have a setup like this depending on what kind of games you like to play. And of note, if you want to use a phone, maybe you've got an extra one laying around for emulation, then I would recommend using my starter guide. I made both a written guide and a video last year, and they still are pretty relevant at this point. And so if you do have a phone or any other Android based device, this is what I recommend using to get your setup done. Anyway, when it comes to just retro game emulation, there's a couple things worth noting. Number one, when you are playing with a phone like this, I do think it's in your best interest to try to play more wide games. That's because the phone itself is so wide, it's like a 20 by 9 aspect ratio. When you play 16 by 9 games, you know, like PSP or PlayStation 2 with a white screen hack, then it will diminish those black bars on the left and right. And of course, because a lot of more modern phones are pretty powerful, you'll be able to play some high-end systems, things like PlayStation 2 or Nintendo Switch, and so you'll be able to take advantage of that wider screen option. Now playing 4x3 content, you know, like older retro systems is still fine. It's just got really big black bars on the left and right. It's one of those things where it might bother you and might not. I know for me, it used to bother me a lot, but I've kind of gotten over it. However, there is one advantage. If you want to play something really wide, like Nintendo DS or 3DS side by side, you can totally do that. And it's going to look really good on a wider screen device. And so when it comes to emulation with the game Sir G8, I think it's a good fit just depending on the content that you're using. And at the very least, the controls feel great. Those face buttons in particular are awesome. And same thing with the analog sticks. I also think that the D-pad is serviceable enough. However, I think where it really shines is when you do things like native Android games or streaming. And so let's talk a little bit about the streaming experience specifically with the game Sir G8. We'll start with Game Pass streaming, and I think this is a really good fit here with the Xbox. Number one, the controller layout is modeled after the Xbox style, so you have those offset analog sticks. And personally, I don't mind them at all, but I know some people may not like them as much. But either way, I think that this control scheme works really well when trying to play Xbox Remote Play or Game Pass streaming. And because these sticks and triggers are very similar to that controller setup, it's going to be right at home when playing with the game Sir G8. And you've got a bunch of apps to choose from including the official Microsoft apps, but there's another one called XB Play that I really enjoy as well. Either way, yes, I think this is a great fit and probably one of the best ways to use this controller. Next, we're going to try PlayStation streaming. Now, you could just use a third-party app like Chiaki or PS Play, but because this controller has what they call PS mode, I wanted to test that out with the official Remote Play app. After all, this is something they advertise on their website. So here I am connecting to my PS5 at home while I'm here at the studio. And of course, because this is an Android mode, none of the controls are going to work. The official app only works with the PlayStation Portal or a Bluetooth PlayStation controller. Now to switch between the different control modes, we're going to hold on to select and start. And the next mode is the blue chicken one. This is the gamepad touch mode. And this is the one that you use with their key mapping software, so we'll test this one later. However, after holding the buttons again, it'll switch over to white chicken mode. And this is supposed to be the PS mode, but you can see here it's saying it can't use the controller. And sure enough, when I tried to use any sort of controls while in the PlayStation mode, it didn't work for me. So first thing I thought is maybe I needed to do a firmware update. And so let's go ahead and test that out. In the instruction manual, there's a QR code, which will take you to their website. And it turns out this will just link you to the Google Play Store. So you can just go to the Google Play Store and search for a game, sir. Anyway, once we have the app downloaded, let's go ahead and start it up. It's going to ask for access and permission to be able to use it. And depending on if this is your first time, you'll probably get prompted to do a firmware update. And of course, that's exactly what I did. So I went and I updated the firmware. And now let's take a look at some of the features we have within the software. The first one will be calibration. So if you're having issues with your sticks or triggers, this is where you would go to set it back to zero. After that, we have a gamepad testing mode. This is where you'll check to make sure everything is working okay. And yeah, mine's working fine. And finally, we have one called key settings. There's a couple neat things here. Number one, we can switch between the Xbox and Nintendo Switch face button layout. And here you can also map the back buttons as well. For me personally, I'm just going to map them to select and start. But of note, you can only map buttons that are already on the controller. So you can't map these to like the back button in Android. So you are a little bit limited in the fact that this will only mimic buttons that are already there. But depending on the game that you're playing and the loadout, this might be handy. Finally, up top, we have the ability to adjust the dead zones for the sticks and the triggers both. 
and I found the initial settings for these were not full range of motion, so I did have to go in here and set everything to 100, but I also found that I needed a little bit of dead zone specifically for the analog sticks because they weren't 100% at zero. So instead I found that the value that worked the best for me was about 3 to 100 on the analog sticks, and then a full 0 to 100 on the triggers. That gave me a full range of motion for both. Either way, I appreciate the fact that we can adjust our dead zones directly in the app. That's pretty handy. Anyway, now that we have the firmware updated, let's go back to that PlayStation app and try to set up the PlayStation mode again. And here's the weird thing, it actually got worse. So now I can't actually get into the PlayStation mode at all. Anytime I switch between the modes, the app will now ask me if it's okay to connect. And when it gets to the PlayStation mode, it immediately goes back to the Android one. And so unfortunately, I was not able to get the PlayStation mode to work, and I did reach out to GameSir to let them know that I was having this problem. And so hopefully this is something they can investigate and fix in a future software update. As it stands, we still have third-party apps we can use like PS Play and Chiaki, and so no harm, no foul really for me. But because it's a feature they're advertising, I did want to just let you know that it isn't working at least for me right now. Okay, and finally, let's try out the Blue Chicken Gamepad Touch Mode. And this is actually a lot easier than you might think. All you have to do is open up the GameSir app and then launch your game from here. And if it's a touch-based game, it's going to ask you, do you want to switch over to that mode? And we're going to click on the thing that says, yeah, man, I want to do it. From there, once you're in the game, on the very top left, you'll see a little gamepad icon. If you tap on that, it's going to bring up the key mapping software. From here, you can move over your buttons and map them however you'd like. And this is similar to other key mapping software I've seen in dedicated handles, you know, like the Retroids and Odins. But I do appreciate the fact that this is part of a controller attached to a phone. So if you do plan on playing a game like this or Genshin Impact that requires touch inputs, this is the solution right here. And I think it does work pretty well. Okay, I think that's about all I can test with this controller here. This is getting pretty long. So let's go ahead and wrap up and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the GameSir G8 Galileo. And as always, we'll start with what I like. Number one are the controls. I think that everything here just feels really good. The ergonomics are good, all of the buttons feel really nice, and I'm a huge fan of the triggers as well. I also think the price point is a steal. You know, a lot of these other ones are over $80, but this one is way better than those. And if there's a sale or a coupon code like those I have down below, then I think you can get it for even cheaper, and that's pretty great. The other thing that kind of blew my mind about it is just the overall comfort. Like I mentioned in the intro, it doesn't feel like a compromise when I'm using this controller. In fact, I'd rather use these controls than something like the Odin 2. I also found the controller experience to be very sturdy. There was never a moment where I was reminded that this is a phone connected to the controller. Instead, it was just kind of a seamless experience. And while you're limited to using this with a phone, at least with the vanilla version, it is moddable, and I've left a video linked down below which will show you how to use this on a tablet if you'd like. And finally, the other thing I really like about this, and this is just a really tiny detail, but I love that little volume hotkey. It's really handy to be able to change the volume on the fly without having to reach around or figure out wherever the volume buttons are on your phone when you have it in the case. So it's just a little touch that I don't think GameSir needed to do, but I really appreciate that it's there anyway. Now, of course, there's nothing that I review that is perfect, and so let's talk about some of the things I don't like about the GameSir G8. Number one, I think the D-pad is just okay. It gets the job done most of the time, especially when you're playing a more modern game, but this is definitely not something I'd want to play a Street Fighter game in. I think the diagonals are just a little bit harder to push than I would like. And again, this is a very minor thing. I think 99% of the time, nobody's going to notice. I also wish there was some sort of solution if you wanted to use a phone with a case attached to it. Now, obviously, that's going to complicate things, but I think there are people out there who would rather not have to take their case off if they're going to use their phone with this controller. For me personally, I like to use an older phone that's dedicated to this kind of use case. That way, I don't have to deal with the case or any other kind of stuff at all. There are a couple other things I didn't like. Number one is the software hiccups that I had when it came to the PlayStation mode. And hopefully this is something they can fix. And again, I don't think it's really that big of a deal because I can play other apps. But all the same, if they're going to say it can work with PlayStation Remote Play, it should work. And finally, just one thing to bear in mind with this kind of setup in general is that it is a bit of a wide experience. And so if you're looking for something really compact and small to play your retro games, I don't think that using a phone with a controller like this is going to be a good fit anyway. However, when it comes to game streaming or something that's a little bit more wide, I think it's great. But I just wanted to make note of the fact that it is a little bit wider than some dedicated handhelds. So at the end of the day, you're wondering whether or not I recommend the game Sir G8. And I think it's pretty clear by now that yes, I absolutely do recommend it. I've got two schools of thought when 
when it comes to it. Number one, this is the first controller I've actually ever owned that makes me really want to dive into the world of using a phone and a controller combination. All the other times it felt a little bit like a gimmick or something that was just not quite there yet. And I'm happy to report that with the GameStar G8, it feels like it's finally there. In fact, this experience is so good that I think that if I had never seen a retro handheld before, but I did have a setup like this, I wouldn't even really care about retro handhelds in the first place. Because the experience here is really that good. To give you my other perspective is that many people ask me about what I recommend when it comes to these types of controllers, and I'm pretty unenthusiastic when I give a recommendation, and it's usually going to be something like the Razer Kishi version 2 or the Backbone. But even then, I've never been head over heels in love with any of those setups. And the big thing here is that going forward, if anybody ever asks me that question, I'm going to 100% say the G8 Galileo is the one to get. Because the experience here is really just that much better. I can't really put a number on it, but it feels like it's like 5 or 10 times better than those other ones. And so honestly, it's not that often that I really like a controller like this, where I find something that really fits and I'm like good for a while, where I don't want to see any other options. But I think we're finally there when it comes to telescopic controllers, so you're probably not going to see another video like this from me for a while, because I'm going to be too busy playing the GameSir G8 to actually make a different video about a different product. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Are you in the market for any of these controllers, or would you rather use a dedicated handheld? Or is the GameSir G8 kind of making you rethink it like it is for me? As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.